Um, yes, Professor, you can already start. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good day, everyone. Welcome to the Asia Pacific uh, Franchise Federation's Education Webinar. And I am Professor Dr. Azmawani Abdurrahman, CEO and President of Putra Business School. 
And at the same time, I am also the Vice Chairman of National and International Relations Malaysian Franchise Association. So um, today we have a very good topic, an interesting topic, which is on how to enter the Malaysia market. And today we have two prominent speakers who will be sharing with us deeply on this topic. So we have with us right now, Mr. Derek Yeo and also uh, Madam Wong Jini. Yes, the two of them are here already. And, uh, and uh, before I proceed, uh, I, I'm pleased actually to share their short uh, bio. And before that, I would like also to, 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 to remind you that uh, at the, um, throughout the, you can ask any question. If you have any questions, you can post your questions at Q&A section uh, throughout uh, their sharing. You don't wait until the end. And I will be reading their questions. Uh, I will addressing uh, your questions after they uh, finish their presentation. Yeah. So our first speaker, uh, which is Mr. Derek Yeo, will be sharing with us on topic uh, franchising trends yeah, and updates, very important. And let me tell you a bit about Mr. Derek Yeo. So Mr. Derek Yeo, who is currently Secretary General at the Malaysia Franchise Association, and also currently is a Chief Development Officer at the Kopitiam Asia Pacific Senyamber Hat Old Town White Coffee. And Derek Yeo previously was the Director for the Revenue Valley Senyamber Hat, which houses local and international uh, F&B brands such as the Manhattan uh, Fish Market, New York Steak Shack, and the new brand Dapurla. And he has been active in the area of franchise business development for the group for the past 10 years. And he is also the vice chairman of Malaysia Franchise Association uh, 19, uh, 2019 to 2021. He has been frequent contributor to the Malaysian franchise industry for training and seminars provided by Malaysia Franchise Association. Furthermore, he is also chairman of the Franchise Malaysia Exhibition. Derek has been appointed as a chairman, uh, yeah, was the chairman of the Nexus Productivity of Retail and Food Beverages under the Malaysia Productivity Corporation. His international experience include the franchise development and consultancies in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Oman, and many, many more. Yeah. So uh, Derek is all ready right now to share his topic on franchising trends and update. Uh, remember, if you have any question, you can post your questions at question and answer. And Derek, the floor is yours right now. Please, please welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. Let me just try to pull my slide. Okay. Okay, can you see my uh, slide, uh, Professor? Yes, yes, proceed very well. Oh. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'm just here to share a little bit of current updates of our franchising in Malaysia, uh, a little bit of sentiment and also the development, especially after the post-pandemic. Uh, yeah? So uh, what we're going to talk about is a, bit, uh, a little bit quick overview of Malaysia, the demographic, the franchise trends, the new adaptation and new form of business operations after pandemic, expansion of Malaysia franchises, um, the entry, how to enter the market entry processes and also some of the uh, brands that we have here and also a little bit more about our franchise exhibition coming up in May uh, 2023. Now, in terms of populations, uh, we are just like any other ASEAN countries, uh, ASEAN countries members. We have a very diverse uh, uh, cultural ethnic city in Malaysia, especially in terms of populations. We probably currently at 32.5 or 32 slightly more populations at the moment. This is the data in 2021. And uh, of course, we have, um, in terms of the gender population, it's quite balanced, but we have more male over here. Um, and these are the sum of the demographic. We can see that we have the, um, Urbanization, like quite high kind of percentage, about seventy-seven percent density, about ninety-nine percent, especially the urban area. Over literacy, literacy rate is about ninety-five percent, and the next one is about the gateway of to Asia. Malaysia is actually in the center of ASEAN. We can stay a little bit, a bit here. Is that we are very 
um, strategy in terms of location. Same goes for other regions of the uh, ASEAN countries here. In fact, we are uh, able to, uh, to, to reach a lot of uh, markets uh, at our current, uh, I mean, in uh, this uh, uh, location that we are strategically placed, yeah? So um, 32 million of population. So a little bit about this. This is some of, of our Malaysia uh, market um, demographic. Of course, we can, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with Malaysia, but then today the topic is more on the franchise development. So I won't go very deep into the demographic as per se, what I mentioned just now. So um, in Malaysia, we uh, franchise industry is uh, having a few stakeholders holders uh, to build the franchise industry together. Mainly, uh, Malaysia Franchise Association is actually an NGO. We represent the NGO and we are the bridge between players and government. And of course, we are part of WFC and also APFC. And we are the one who support a lot of government agenda and initiative to promote, develop uh, Malaysia franchise uh, brands and products locally and also internationally. As of course, we, Malaysia Franchise Association is also one, one of the uh, uh, one stop center to uh, cater for all the information needed in terms of the franchise industry. Of course, the other, uh, we call it our parents kind of uh, ministry that we work closely is actually the Ministry of Domestic Trade and um, uh, Cost of Living. We have changed the name of this ministry recently. Uh, they are the policy makers. They are the one who have the um, governed the Franchise Act 1998. Malaysia have the uh, Franchise Act 1998 and they are the registrar of franchise, whereby all the uh, franchise business, international or local, will have to go through the registrations uh, in this registrar of franchise under this ministry. And of course, we have uh, different um, government body agencies that help us in terms of developing the franchise industry as well, uh, especially uh, Bernas or the agency under them is like Medec. And uh, they are the ones who actually apply, uh, arrange and help in terms of the franchise financing uh, assistance. Yeah. Now, a little bit of franchise trend in Malaysia, of course, I think it's quite similar to some of our uh, Asian ASEAN uh, members here. Food and beverage or FMB uh, is actually the highest percentage of the franchise compositions in Malaysia. So, uh, it follows, we, it is actually followed by the service and maintenance, uh, learning center and training, um, clothing and accessories, beauty and health, electronics and ICT, convenience shops and supermarket, and also others. This is the, the trends of a franchise in terms of uh, uh, by uh, category or by sectors, by industry. Yeah? Now, in terms of the number of uh, registrations uh, company that uh, we have captured under the ministry and also the association, we have around 1,154 uh, total registers uh, brand uh, from homegrown brand to the foreign brands uh, in this uh, franchise uh, environment and in the sectors, yeah. Now, uh, in terms of, uh, like uh, what I said just now, in terms of demands of uh, franchise business, locally or um, internationally about on Malaysia brand, definitely the first one is still food and beverage. Uh, second one will be retailing. Third one will be training and education, especially the uh, children enrichment uh, centers or brands or products. And of course, the beauty and health. <clears throat> so there are also emerging trends um, that we actually notice um, in Malaysia uh, franchise industry. So the Korean food is still very uh, popular here. Uh, Japanese food has been here for a while. There are, there are many more uh, shops open uh, in the recent years, Thai food especially. And then there's the coffee trends uh, in Malaysia right now. A lot of coffee players are in the, in, in the market right now from different places uh, of the world. Of course, there are also uh, local brands uh, and also uh, they are also very... Uh, authentic um, boutique brands uh, happening, uh, uh, blooming in Malaysia market in terms of coffee uh, trend. We also have healthy food coming very strongly after pandemic, which I will talk about it later on. Then there are also emerging trends 
such as the self-service laundry, or we, we call it the coin-operated laundry previously, the healthcare, especially the pharmacy, um, there are different healthcare uh, providers now coming into the franchise uh, industry as well, um, related, yeah, healthcare related, cleaning services, sanitizing services, home maintenance, uh, even wheel writing services is also some of the trends we saw in the market. Islamic pawn broking is also that we have in, in Malaysia. And of course, the education tutoring subject specific enrichment centers is something more and more um, very niche um, subjects for uh, specialties, uh, training or, or learning has been also on the uptrend in Malaysia. So we, we also see that there is a, a continuous request and then, then also a lot of build up in terms of fitness, uh, health related fitness center, martial arts, women's center, Muslima, young, exact kind of a very specialized uh, gym or um, health and beauty centers uh, booming in Malaysia. Um, we have the Muslima or the uh, Muslima clothing uh, brands that is uh, also uh, developing in Malaysia. We have the child care center, nursery, and there are a lot of retailing, uh, especially the convenience stores, um, opening a lot in Malaysia in the recent past two, three years. Yeah? Um, brands such as, uh, if you remember, if you know, uh, besides 7-Eleven, which, which has been here for many years, there are also brands such as the Family Marts, um, CU, um, all these convenience stores is actually um, everywhere that you can see if you come to Malaysia right now. So the new, the pandemic has actually really changed some of the uh, consumer behaviors and also the, uh, the needs and also the um, requests or also the ways, uh, you know, the lifestyle here in Malaysia. I mean, I think it should also be similar to a lot of places, but then um, we can see there's an increase in digital adoption, people shifting to digital platform for day-to-day -day needs. Um, Changing to in terms of mobility patterns, uh, probably now after pandemic, there are also there are a lot of companies are still practicing uh, work from home uh, a day or some two days work from home per week. So the pattern of uh, transporting or mobility is slightly different. Uh, changes in purchasing behaviors, I would say that is actually a habit during the lockdown. Probably you are the consumers are. Uh, spending more time online to purchase and shopping. So this has, uh, the behavior has not changed a lot now. They are actually continuing now online shopping. Uh, increased awareness of health. This is uh, very obvious. Um, even though now it is like kind of uh, quite uh, after two, three years, the pandemic uh, uh, lifestyle, people are still wearing masks. You can see some people, most people are still wearing masks in the very crowded places. They have a more uh, higher expectation in terms of hygiene and also in terms of healthy eating behaviors. They have more uh, requests and uh, ways of looking at the food uh, lately or recent recent months. Yeah, you can see the differences. So in terms of uh, interpersonal, interpersonal behavior, of course, we can see these are data that we, we, we take on, or we, we actually can gather, but then um, one of the very obvious one is actually the pet adoption during the pandemic. But then I think that the, the, there are also pets uh, franchise that we can see in Malaysia that is also doing quite well uh, at the moment. Now, in terms of in, um, in this new normal, when we say it's a new normal, is or, or after the uh, all these uh, uh, three years, past three years, and also after the opening of the businesses or the economics uh, the past one year, um, there are many, when we talk about uh, entry into Malaysia, what are the, some insights that I can share here is that even the local or the brands that has, has been doing business here, they start to do a lot of innovation in terms of their products. Yeah, so they do a lot of collaborations, brands and brands, a lot of collaborations together because I think um, all of us have uh, experienced the difficulty during the pandemic. So collaboration is something that we can help each other and actually also can actually expand and leverage on each other's uh, uh, customers or even the database together. So adaptive, uh, adaptive price offerings also is something that we can see, especially in the FMB scene, that uh, 
um, there are segmentizing kind of a uh, practice price pricings in terms of uh, uh, menu offerings and products offering is uh, being offered now, especially they understand there are different uh, requests or different category of consumer behaviors are different from the previous way they are doing business. So they're trying and adapting and uh, to new way of uh, 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 giving affordable or even uh, to capture different segments of the consumers. And of course, uh, one of the uh, the way we, we one of the challenge that we understand during the uh, the pandemic time, actually the lockdown time, in terms of the retail or even the FMB, that is that, that the the shipping or the shipment or the export import has been disrupted quite uh, badly. So in terms of sourcing for ingredients, especially the FMB um, category, they have to actually be self uh, reliant on on the products that are available in the local scene. So that's why actually there are a lot of localized ingredients or sourcing happenings. And because of that, um, a lot of new uh, limited menu has been offered during this period of time. And moving, I think because of that now, a lot of uh, uh, brands are trying to work together with the um, farmers or even directly from the farms to to get to source for their ingredients. So, so those are some of the changes that we see happening now. And of course, digitalizing um, has been uh, sped up. I think digitalizing in Malaysia has been happening many years ago, even before pandemic, but then the pandemic actually sped up everything. So if you can see uh, during the pandemic, a lot of uh, Malaysia is one of the country that depends a lot on uh, uh, labor, foreign labor, uh, especially in the, uh, retail and FMB uh, environment, even the service sectors and also the uh, maintenance sectors. Uh, during the pandemic, a lot of them went back to their hometown. Then after the economic recovery, uh, they are not back yet. So there's a shortage of uh, a labor force in the market while the business is going uh, better and better. So there's a need of uh, moving forward uh, from a very conventional way of doing business to digitalizing in terms of uh, doing business. Uh, Besides providing uh, relief in terms of labor shortage, they also give uh, the consumer a new way of uh, a new experience to the consumer in terms of um, dining out or even uh, shopping uh, uh, at the comfort of their home. So because of that, there are different operating costs, new operating costs incurred. Uh, of course, that, therefore, uh, doing business now probably have some additional costs or some new costs, may not be additional, but new costs that is happening uh, comparing to three years uh, ago. So those these are changes that are happening. So in terms of changes in store design, restaurant design, retail stores, or even any shop lots kind of design, uh, I think uh, most of the players are looking at maximizing the space, uh, looking at how uh, productive one, one square feet, square foot kind of uh, uh, space can give the return on investment. So these are the changes. So in terms, in, instead of uh, having a very big um, storefront, probably uh, there are a lot of compact kind of sizes uh, uh, built up or offerings, a kind of a new setups is being offered. You can see around the, in the market. And of course, um, a lot of brands, <clears throat> a lot of businesses are diversifying their business, uh, mainly I think because it's to uh, also uh, spread the risk or spread the offerings or offer more products based on their uh, capability and also to actually leverage on their uh, specializations or even their um, capabilities in terms of their, their backend supports to different segments. It may be the same industry, but different segment or different brands. So this is what we see that some brands are having two, three smaller brands or two, three new brands. Uh, but it's actually from the same group. So this is what it, we can see in the market in Malaysia. So um, if you're coming to Malaysia, uh, especially the FMB industry, um, of course, halal, uh, as a population of Malaysia, we have around 60 to 70% of our population in Malaysia is actually Muslim uh, community. So halal is uh, one of the key uh, elements that, uh, for us to reach out to everybody because halal means that everybody can actually enjoy the food if you have halal uh, recognized uh, certification. So that is one uh, insights that you may, you may know, you may want to know. 
And of course, um, um, smaller concept like you, you see here, even um, uh, collaborations between, you can see here what I showed here is actually the latest collaboration between our local brand T-Life uh, with a very um, a reputable uh, products called Milo. They had just uh, done a collaboration, I think two days ago. Um, there's a lot of farm to table products now from farm to the restaurant. So this is why I say they have a lot of localized sourcing happening in Malaysia. Um, ready to dish, meaning that you, it's convenient food where you can buy and then just microwave or just heat up or just a water bath, you can actually enjoy the food. These are some of the uh, new invention after the post-COVID, but it still carry on and continue until now. Um, I think the other thing that um, the government or the, the public uh, in Malaysia, especially, of course, in the European or the, the other Western society, they have been talking about ESG for quite a while, but um, over here in Malaysia, we've started to talk about it two, three years ago, even four, five years ago. But then recent years, I think a lot more companies are talking about it and environmental uh, sustainability efforts and government's effort, yeah. So um, a lot of brands is looking into that um, um, seriously. They are doing uh, that not because of uh, they were asked to do, but we, we understand during the COVID time, there are brands, there are situations where supply chain was disrupted there were even times that we were facing some shortage of protein, especially chicken, the egg previously. But then um, there are a lot of innovation products coming into the market, especially um, plant-based item, which is also healthy options, plant-based chicken, uh, even plant-based egg, which is also uh, available in the market at the moment. So these are some of the changes in terms of uh, um, uh, doing business in Malaysia in terms of the, the landscape change, in terms of offerings, in terms of customers' behavior and customer consumers' kind of uh, expectations. Yeah. So this is what I can actually share, the recent uh, trend happening in Malaysia. So of course, uh, expansion of Malaysian franchises. Um, <clears throat> well, you can see that is a lot of homegrown brand, franchise brand that you may have heard about it or you may not tell about it, but this is the fact that um, we are very strong in FMB. Definitely you can uh, understand that there we have Mary Brown. If you know Mary Brown, it's a fast food, uh, fast food uh, category. Uh, secret recipe, the cake, uh, the Tarik Place, the Manhattan Fish Market, the seafood, US Pizza. US Pizza is a Malaysia brand pizza uh, pizza chain. Old Town, Old Town White Coffee is a comfort food, Malaysian food. Pony is the retail um, garment for kids, uh, clothing. Clean Pro Laundry Bra is automated coin uh, laundry. And we have very strong education sectors, especially the uh, children enrichment from the, the arts uh, to the English uh, learning to the uh, Islamic elite, uh, Islamics uh, uh, learning. Um, even though we have our own mathematics uh, uh, kids learning uh, franchise brand. Yeah? So these are some of the homegrown brand and which are uh, expanding and growing the, uh, year by year. So um, currently Malaysia brand is in a lot of countries. Uh, uh, mainly these are the top 10 countries that have uh, Malaysia brands presence. Uh, if you can see here, we are, uh, have a lot of brands, a lot of uh, outlets in Saudi Arabia followed by Indonesia, USA, Australia, and China. So um, yeah, we, we hope that there are more brands that can penetrate these uh, countries and more countries to come. So a uh, little bit on our uh, Malaysia Association or Malaysia Franchise Industry um, events. And uh, we are going to follow all these events you can see here. Starting from next month, May, we will participate in the Malaysia Pavilion. We will bring Malaysia brands uh, to this trip, different trade missions uh, from Melbourne to Bangkok to Jakarta to Turkey and Bangalore for a specialized business mission. Of course, we will also be um, visiting the uh, Philippine uh, show in October and uh, as in conjunction with the World Franchise Council meetings and also the uh, Asia Pacific meeting. Yeah. So now, um, I, I will not go into very uh, detail on the franchise side where I think Ms. Wong will be sharing later. So of course, uh, key considerations to a Malaysian market, of course, you need 
everyone knew Kian understands that to come into any market, uh, not just Malaysia, you need to have your USB of your brand, uh, your unique selling propositions of a brand. Um, understand a little bit your market share uh, if you come into Malaysia, your targeted consumer group of your brand. Uh, where do you intend to place your store location, the strategic plan? Is it a shopping mall? Is it a shop lot? Uh, well, those are considerations, serious consideration you need to think of. Um, the type of franchisee that you're looking for, are you looking for a single franchisee or a multiple or a, you want to appoint a master franchisee? And of course, the investment value of your brand. So whether the brand, uh, well, what kind of, is, uh, is it uh, um, uh, in Malaysia, we have a, a micro franchise, we have a, a, a bigger franchise, different setup of franchise available. So when you come in, probably you will need to understand a little bit what will be the uh, best uh, uh, franchise package or uh, investment needed that you can offer to the Malaysia uh, market. Yeah. So um, a little bit of promotion. We are having our 30th International Franchise, International uh, Convention and Exhibition Franchise Conference uh, in coming May in our Kuala Lumpur City, Cent uh, City Convention Center in KLCC. So this year, uh, the, the theme is Rebuilding Growth, Spurring Excellence. So it will be held on the, 20th, on the 18th to 20th May, 2023. We have 140 booths. Uh, expecting 115,000 uh, or uh, more visitors. And we hope to actually attract around 123 million kind of um, uh, potential investment transaction in this coming exhibition. Yeah, so I, um, yeah, so what are the activities uh, that we'll have in this convention or this exhibition will be, of course, the exhibition. We have the international conference from the local and international speakers. We have the workshop, of course, uh, business matching, and we are flying in some of the um, interested buyers for in-buying missions in, in KLCC itself. Yeah, so far we have around 77 companies uh, registered, uh, 77 brands, 111 booths uh, 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 rented uh, I mean, sold. So we still have some booths. I think uh, there are still a lot of inquiries coming on. Yep, so the countries that is participating this year are Brunei, Australia, South, Africa, South, Africa, South Korea, Indonesia, Philippines, of course, Japan, USA, Taiwan, and Singapore. Yeah, so this is a layout of the KLCC. And yeah, thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can actually uh, put it in your Q&A. Thank you, thank Professor. You. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Derek, for very fruitful sharing on trends and updates uh, on franchise uh, industry. Yeah? Thank you very much. I have yet to see any uh, question posted at the questions and answer box. So please, if you have any question, please uh, post your questions and questions and answer. Yeah? So moving, moving on, uh, we uh, have our next speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Madam Wong Jini, to talk about the legal aspect of franchising. So before that, I would like to read a short bio of uh, Madam Wong Jini. Eh? So while uh, she's preparing for the, for the slides, uh, Wong Jini obtained her law degree from the University of Sydney, Australia, and was admitted uh, as an advocate and solicitor in the High Court of Malaya in 1991. Jini is one of the founding partner of Wong Jini and Theo, the firm, with more than 30 years of experience um, uh, practicing exclusively uh, in the IP field. Jini is passionate about IP. Her practice predominantly focuses on the non-contentious commercial and transaction matters, advising clients on various aspects of IP portfolio development protection, management enforcement, and monetization. Jini also regularly advises clients on franchise matters and guides them on the applicability of the franchise regime to the business model while structuring agreements to suit their specific needs. She has assisted various local clients with the regional and international expansion of their franchise operation. So uh, Jini has guided clients on cross-border and transactional collaboration throughout the world and has assisted many startups, SMEs, 
and PLCs in identifying and protecting their key IP assets, including advising on filing strategies, building and managing their IP portfolios. So Gini has also successfully implemented brand protection and enforcement program for various Fortune 500 corporations in diverse industry. So that's a brief introduction. So Madam Wong Gini, all yours. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Um, yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and for those uh, who are calling in from a different time zone, good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, APFC and Malaysian Franchise Association, MFA, for inviting me to speak uh, at the APFC Education webinar today. I think the webinar is indeed very timely, given that there have been significant changes uh, to the franchise legislation and practice in Malaysia for the past year or so. So this is the agenda of my presentation. I'll talk a little bit on uh, the laws, uh, who should register uh, under the franchise regime, when to register, uh, what is the platform for registration, and what are the effects and non-compliance, uh, uh, ramifications of non-compliance, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A. So as a Malaysian, uh, I'm very proud to say that Malaysia is one of the earlier countries in the world uh, with a sui generis franchise legal framework. So we have our Franchise Act 1998 uh, that has been like more than 25 years, uh, 24 years, and we embrace the concept of disclosure, uh, piloting concept, registration requirements, as well as mandatory provisions. So I'll walk you through uh, the franchise regime in Malaysia. And <clears throat> based on one of the surveys conducted by uh, Advert Global Services, uh, one of the companies that conduct such survey for franchise business for you know, uh, Malaysia as a place to do business, legal concern had for international brands has been identified as one of the issues. So seminars and webinars like this will be a very good platform uh, for people to understand what are the regime, you know, or what are the misconceptions and how to address all these issues. So before any entity uh, wants to enter a particular market, you know, in particular Malaysia, uh, you need to consider a myriad of issues. And by all means, these are not exhaustive. Right, uh, And as we know that franchise business, uh, intellectual properties, especially brands, would be your backbone or your core selling point. Right, So it is important for a potential franchisor who is interested in to, uh, to expand into Malaysian market to consider filing the trademarks in Malaysia. And as we know, IP rights are territorial in nature, meaning that if you protect your rights in your country of origin, uh, such rights will not be automatically extended to Malaysia. So you need to file in Malaysia. And you can do it uh, by way of national filing, meaning that you can file directly in Malaysia, or you can file it through Madrid Protocol, which we became a member in 2019. And if you have copyrighted works like your SOP, your manuals, uh, your programs, your software programs, you may even consider a voluntary recorder with Malaysian IP office, MIPO, uh, but it's not mandatory for the copyright to enjoy corporate protection in Malaysia. And before you share any confidential information, your trade secrets, your systems, your business format with your potential business uh, partners, you may want them to sign a non-disclosure agreement to ensure that they do not disclose the information shared you know, uh, beyond the purposes that they were shared. And if you have any other IP rights, be it industrial design, or inventions that are inventive that you protect by way of patents, uh, you should actually consider uh, filing them in Malaysia before you actually disclose uh, such inventions or uh, industrial designs. As far as franchise regime is concerned, I think a lot of concerns or there will be a lot of issues raised. What are the pre-contractual requirements? Uh, do you have the ability to enter into an MOU, a letter of intent, whatever you call it, a term sheet, Right, to secure deposit. And normally as a potential franchisor, you want to secure a deposit so that your efforts in discussing or in identifying uh, the potential candidate will not be go uh, will not go down the drain if assuming the material uh, the matters uh, does not materialize, right? And of course uh, confidentiality obligations as well. 
And you need to think about the registration requirements, uh, piloting concept. Is it similar to China where you need to have your one sh uh, your shop here first? What are the issues? What are the disclosure requirements? And more importantly, when you are negotiating or discussing with your potential partners, uh, you should conduct a due diligence on you know, the entity. And you could do so using the Malaysian database like uh, Companies Commission of Malaysia, SSM, or CITOS, uh, which is a credit reporting agency. And you could also reach out to MFA, Malaysian Franchise Association, where um, MFA has a wealth of uh, database on its you know, uh, business partners or the franchisees or potential franchisors in Malaysia. Uh, last but not least, you may want to seek uh, the assistance of local counsel or franchise consist, uh, consultant to advise you on the legal regime in Malaysia. And that's on franchise regime. But as we all know, franchise, even though you may have a franchise law, but there are laws that may have direct or indirect impact on franchising. Yeah? Or one, one very important aspect would be the tax regime. Because for any potential franchisor, you want to make sure that the payment made by your franchisees are remitted back to you in your original country. And you want to know whether there's any withholding tax and how many percent do you need to gross up, right? Uh, and if you're dealing with consumers or you know, members of the public, you'll be gathering personal data. And you need to make sure that they, uh, you know, your local partners comply with personal data protection, especially in light of a lot of leakages, you know, incidents of data breaches, right? And in Malaysia, we do have a trade and foreign investment restrictions, and it's, uh, the license is called WRT. It's, 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 uh, you need to uh, address that in the event you're a foreign investor uh, looking to invest in Malaysia. Employment laws. And if you're in a dominant position or if you are imposing certain terms, you need to actually consider uh, anti-competition law or we have a competition act. So this is basically a big picture of various issues that you need to uh, address. Of course, the focus on our webinar this uh, today would be on the franchise ecosystem, which will be mainly on Franchise Act and the regulation. And that will involve uh, the related documentation, like the franchise agreement, franchise disclosure document, manuals, such as operating manuals or training manuals. And it's very important to be mindful of the regulators. The regulator in Malaysia is the Ministry of Domestic Trade and Cost of Living, and in short, is referred to as MDT. What are the current practices and procedures which may not be found in the franchise legislation? So uh, just a walk through of the Franchise Act in Malaysia. So we had our first, uh, the first act, uh, wait, the act was first implemented uh, on the 8th of October 1999. It, it is called the Franchise Act 1998, but it came into force 8 October 1999. And the first amendment uh, was in 2012, and it came into force 1st January 2013. And the most recent amendment, which have a tremendous impact, and changes to the practices and the laws uh, is of the Franchise Amendment 2020, which came into force on the 28th of April last year. So for those of you who may have been quite familiar with the franchise regime uh, before 2022, uh, so these are some of the key provisions, right? For a foreign franchisor prior to this Amendment Act, you only need to apply for approval under what we call as Section 54. But because of this amendment, now there's an additional provision that you need to apply under, which is Section 6, right? But the good thing is, you don't need to have a separate application. It's one application, it's merged application, and you apply under one application under MyFax, yeah? MyFax 2.0. And with this amendment, uh, there is a, a requirement for franchisees to, whether the local franchisors or foreign franchisors, to register now. And it is an offence for the franchisees not to do so. Okay. And previously, if you register your franchise before 2022, uh, the registration is valid until it is terminated or suspended. But now, there's a period of effectiveness. You need to renew every five years. So it's not for an indefinite period. So you have to be mindful of when is your uh, uh, expiration date. 
And if you want to make changes to your franchise agreement, your disclosure documents, or your other supporting documents, you need to obtain uh, prior approval from the Registrar of Franchise, and it's called a material change uh, application. Okay. And for franchise agreement, there are additional terms that have to be, these are called mandatory provisions in the franchise agreement. They have to be incorporated into the franchise agreement, failing which it is an, a criminal offence, right? Previously, it is uh, deemed to be null and void, but now they just term it as it is a criminal offence. So who should uh, take steps to register? Of course, foreign franchisor, if you intend to uh, venture into Malaysian market, as a foreign franchisor, you would have to register. Or if you are given the master franchise right, you have to register. Or if you appoint, if you are a local master uh, franchisor or a local master franchisee appointed by a foreign franchisor, you would have to register as well. So franchisee to foreign franchisor, franchisee to local franchisors. So these are the group of uh, register applicants that should submit for approval under the Franchise Act. Of course, I'm not mentioning you know uh, people like franchise broker or franchise consultant. Um, due to time constraint, we'll just focus on foreign franchisors, right? So, if you're a foreign franchisor, uh, you need to be in operation for at least three years before you could actually apply uh, for approval, because you need to submit your three years audited accounts, right? And for a local master franchisee appointed by a local a foreign franchisor, you have to be in operation for three years as well before you can actually appoint sub-franchisees. And for franchisees uh, of foreign franchisors, you need to get registration before commencing your business in Malaysia. And of course, for franchisees of local franchisors, you have to do so within 14 days of signing the franchise agreement. So this is basically a big picture of uh, when to register. And the portal, we have a new portal. Uh, uh, basically, it was just implemented last year. So if you Google MyFax 2.0, uh, it will bring you to this uh, link. And then you can actually go through them. You can even do a search whether a particular uh, brand has actually been registered. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's important for you to, you know, at least uh, be aware of this portal. And for those of you who have registered in Malaysia before 2022, April 2022, you may think that you can just come into Malaysia and start to operate your franchise. Uh, this is just a reminder that with the coming into force of the Franchise Amendment Act 2020, uh, there is now a requirement of re-registration. So even though you may have been approved prior to April 28th of last year, you still have to do your re-registration. And at the moment, NDT has given a three years grace period from 1st August 2022 until 1st August 2025 for any uh, franchisors to do the re-registration. And there'll be a waiver of the re-registration or the approval fee. So if you don't do your re-registration, this may result in notice of suspension, termination or cancellation being uh, issued by MDT. And you can't appoint your franchisees, right? And it's also important for you to do your re-registration because unlike the previous registration regime, where once you're registered, you are registered forever until it's terminated. But now you need to renew every five years. And in order to dis to determine when is your expiry date, uh, the approval date for the re-registration will be used as the date to calculate the five-year period. Okay, And another requirement that is not found in the Act is that franchisors and master franchisees must register for their franchisees. And for new registration, assuming that you have not done any re uh, registration uh, before this, uh, make sure that you're aware there will be new requirements uh, for foreign franchisors. Previously, uh, foreign franchisors are not expected to submit a uh, franchise disclosure documents. But under the new registration, you have to submit your franchise disclosure documents. And there are other documentation that you need to support. Uh, for example, your three years audited accounts, your manuals. And once it's registered, it's valid for five years from the approval date. And there'll be new fee uh, structure uh, for local 
franchise source is 1,000 ringgit is around 222 US dollars uh, based on 4.5 exchange rate. I mean, Malaysian ringgit has declined somewhat. And for foreign franchise or previously it was 1,000, now it has gone up to 5,000. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are the, some of the standard documentation for registration. So you need a template of your franchise agreement. And the template of franchise agreement must comply with the Franchise Act. So even if you have a template that you have adopted in Australia, in other countries, you can't just adopt the same template in Malaysia. You need to localize it. You need to make sure that the, um, the provisions comply with the Malaysian Franchise Act. And you need a franchise disclosure document, and that's a prescribed format. And if you have manuals, be it operation manual or training manual, you need to support that. And your three years audited accounts and any other supporting documents. For example, if you are not uh, the trademark owners, there is a consent letter from your related entity or from a, another party. You need to submit that as well. And these are the mandatory terms uh, in the franchise agreement, which must be inserted in the franchise agreement. Otherwise, it is an offence. I will not go through it in details, but if you want the deck, I can actually provide you, you know, with, with the deck that you can go through. Or it can be found in Section 18.2a to m of the Franchise Act. If you Google, uh, or even on the Malaysian Franchise Association website, we do have a, a, temp, uh, you know, a, a Franchise Act where you can actually download. And there are uh, uh, mandatory provisions that have to be included into the franchise agreement. Otherwise, it is a criminal offence. So I'll just point out uh, some key provisions uh, fail because failure to provide or to comply with this would be an offence, a criminal offence. Yeah. So this is a compulsory practice, meaning that before you sign the franchise agreement, uh, you must provide a copy of the franchise agreement and the franchise disclosure document to your potential uh, candidate, right? At least 10 days, right? So failing which it may be a criminal offence. And there is a cooling off period in the sense that uh, you must cater for an option for the franchisee to terminate the franchise agreement uh, within seven working days from the date of the agreement. So if they decide to terminate during this period, this cooling off period, then they are entitled to get a refund of the money minus the expenses that you have incurred as a franchisor in preparing the franchise agreement. Right? So that's another important. And bear in mind, it's seven working days. It's not seven days. Right? So you need to calculate. You know, In Malaysia, most of the time, we'll, use, uh, we'll discount uh, Saturday and Sunday, depending on which state you are. And as, as I mentioned earlier, there's a material change application that you need to comply with before making changes uh, to the franchise agreement. So let's say you have a, uh, your template has been approved. Uh, and you want to make changes, you want to increase the fees, you want to revise the territorial rights, you need to submit that for pr approval before you actually implement or roll out to your franchisees. And if you were to uh, require your franchisees to pay advertising and promotion fee, you need to make sure that there is a promotion fund established and it has to be managed under a separate bank account and it has to be used only for the franchise business. So if you have two brands and you cannot use uh, the money that you have taken for one brand to promote another brand. yeah. And every year as a franchisor, you need to file in an annual report. In short, it's called LTPF. That is an acronym for the annual report in Malay within six months from each financial year. So if you fail to do so consecutively for five years, you know, your franchise registration can actually be terminated by the registrar. So that's very important. And when you submit your annual report, you make sure that you must submit a financial statement of the fund, which is endorsed by a registered public accountant. So other important uh, provisions in the Franchise Act would be prohibition against discrimination. A franchisor cannot unreasonably or materially discriminate amongst its franchisees if such discrimination is going to cause competitive harm. So there are a few things that you cannot discriminate. For example, the franchise fees, royalties, goods, services, equipment, rentals or advertising services. There are some exceptions 
but you're just being you have to be mindful that you cannot uh, cater for royalty of five percent for one group of franchisees and three percent for another unless you can justify it. And for confidential information, a franchisee is required to give a written uh, warrant guarantee that he must not disclose the information contained in the operation manual or obtained while undergoing training during or for a period of two years. So I must just remind franchisors that these are criminal offences, right? But if you're aware of confidential information, you know that confidential information can be protected forever. Right. So don't give away your rights by just limiting it to two years. Right. So confidential information can be protected forever and ever. One good example would be uh, Coca-Cola, you know, the recipe or KFC's uh, herbs, or the, the recipe as well. It's just that this provision is to cater for criminal offences. So there is a difference, right? And another unique uh, provision in our Franchise Act, which is an exception to a normal business, is it allows franchisor to restrain a franchisee you know, from conducting a similar business during and for a period of two years after the termination or expiration of the franchise agreement. And it's quite important to note that you know, these obligations relating to confidential information and restraint of trade are extended not only to the franchisees, but to the franchisees, directors, immediate families, spouses, right? So uh, it has far-reaching implications. Some noteworthy provisions would include, you cannot have a franchise agreement that is less than five years term, so the minimum term must be for five years. And there is a provision for extension or renewal Right? And if a franchisee wants to extend and it gives the franchisor not less than six months prior to the expiration date, and unless the franchisee has breached the franchise agreement, the franchisor must extend. Similarly, where renewal is concerned, it is a criminal offence if you don't renew unless you come within this exception. You compensate the franchisee by repurchasing or you waive the similar trade uh, restraint or you actually give the franchisee uh, six months notice prior to the expiration date. So what are the implications or the effects of non-compliance or non-registration? So, as a start, you'll be violating the Franchise Act, right? And when you violate the Franchise Act and it is a criminal offence, uh, you may be subject to prosecution risk where there will be fines or jail term. Or you may be subject to compound, you know, instead of uh, taking you to court, uh, the regulator may just impose a compound. But from a franchisor's perspective, uh, the agreement will be considered unlawful and un unenforceable, right? What it means is can be declared as null and void by the court if assuming your franchisees were to challenge that. Right? And if the court were to declare that it's null and white, it can also declare that you cannot appoint new franchisees and it can also declare that you have to refund all the monies that you received from the franchisee to the franchisees. Right? And of course, if you don't register, you, know, you, you, you can't get the certificate of uh, registration for display and that itself is another def uh, offence. Apart from exposing the companies to the liabilities, you may also expose the directors and the officers. So these are some serious uh, consequences of non-registration. Yeah. So basically, these are an overview of uh, the franchise regime in Malaysia. Uh, you know, I understand that my time is also up. Uh, I'm, I, ha I believe there are some questions which I will leave it to the moderator to pose it. To and read out the, the questions in, in the interest of time. Thank you so much thank for, you. for your attention. Yes, thank you, Madam Wongjini. Always a very good sharing from you. I, I'm sure that participant benefits a lot from your sharing. Uh, now I can see from the question and answer box, there's uh, three uh, total number of questions and two already answered by uh, uh, Mr. Derek. And there's one question here on the three years of audited account financial account. So can I ask you, uh, Madam Wonjini, to address that question? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, yes, in order for you to be approved as a franchisor, be it local or foreign franchisor, you need to be in operation for at least three years so that you have 
your audited accounts, right? I think the rationale for this is if you have not been in operation for at least three years, you will not be in a position to provide support or guidance uh, to your master franchisee or your franchisee, right? So uh, the short answer is yes, you need to be in business for at least three years and get your audited accounts before you can actually get approval. Okay, thank you. I, I guess that, that answer is very clear and thank you for the questions and interest. And uh, you can always uh, reach to the secretariat. Okay, that's one more. How about three years audited account in foreign country? That, that, yeah. Yes, that is acceptable because if you're a foreign franchisor, uh, yeah. before you come into Malaysia, you know, you can't, you can't operate in Malaysia without the franchise uh, registration, right? So if you have been you know, operating in another country, let's say in Australia for the past four or five years, then you can actually use your audited accounts in Australia to apply as a foreign franchisor. Okay, thank you. So you can you can uh, reach to the secretariat and you can contact Derek and also Madam Wong Jini. So we are towards the end of our webinar and on behalf of the Asia Pacific Franchise uh, Confederation and Malaysia Franchise Association, I would like to extend a very sincere thanks to both speakers and I hope that uh, this uh, webinar benefits uh, all of you and uh, I hope to see you in the next webinar. Assalamualaikum, good day and thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.